of your assets with today's special guest, Scott Royal Smith. Today's episode is brought to you by Builderall. They are my favorite all-in-one solution for your online business. Everything you need to start your online business from landing pages to emails to selling your first products, all without breaking the bank. Find out how Builderall can help you grow your online business at servedomaster.com forward slash Builderall. Are you tired of dealing with your boss? Do you feel underpaid and underappreciated? If you want to make it online, fire your boss and start living your retirement dreams now, then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Serve No Master Podcast, where you'll learn how to open new revenue streams and make money while you sleep. Presented live from a tropical island in the South Pacific by best-selling author, Jonathan Green. Now, here's your host. Now, I'm really interested in kind of the legal and tax world that a lot of people that become entrepreneurs never think about it until it's too late. And I've saw in some of your content, you mentioned that people in real estate always end up getting sued. Like 95% of people end up in lawsuits. Can you tell me a little bit about why that happens? And is it because they're all making mistakes or is it just what makes it so inevitable? I mean, when, everything here got really um, clear for me when I had a friend that lost over $5 million from a single lawsuit. And he was an entrepreneur and was a real estate investor, but he owned all of his assets in his personal name. And so then he had a deal that went sideways that he was working on, ended up in a lawsuit. And he thought like, oh, my insurance is going to cover me from protect me from these, you know, from lawsuits and stuff. And uh, but he didn't know is that insurance never covers you from anything that's at a like breach of contract action or anything like that. It only covers you from really basic accidents. And because he had all his assets in his own name, they knew that he was like a perfect contact to like sue. And then boom, then I go, he like lost millions of dollars essentially overnight from a lawsuit. And this is really typical, actually. From my background working in litigation, I was suing insurance companies before I got into like wealth building through real estate. That you find that it's like insurance is a great first line of defense, but it, it's really just a partial defense to what you really need if you want to become bulletproof. And that honest people get sued all the time because what happens is somebody gets hurt. They want to blame somebody else. And so everybody lies. It's just the nature of the game, right? That's why everybody hates lawyers. But it's the system. The system is built up for everybody to lie about everything. And so you can't depend on people being honest. It doesn't matter if you're honest. Really, all that matters is did you do the preparation to make sure that you're covered in case something happens? So what are the most common reasons that people end up in lawsuits? Is it just because of a deal doesn't work out? Or are there other things that cause it? Yeah, I mean, lawsuits can happen for a lot of reasons, right? Like, we have um, some people that have come in place that end up with a car accident that exceeds the limits of liabilities of their car insurance policies because they just wanted like the absolute cheapest insurance. And then boom, now they're in a lawsuit, right? And they have all of their assets in their personal name. And so now everything they own is subject to being taken from them from the lawsuit. It can happen because like any contract that you have, whether it's with like a tenant in the real estate space or any of your business contracts, even things down to like simple like text messages and emails, right? Hiring contractors to work on your house. All of these things, if you're doing them inside of your personal name, any of them can pop up to be a lawsuit. So the the game isn't how can you control what's going to happen if a lawsuit's going to happen because lawsuits can come from anywhere in life, right? You you never see them coming; they hit hit you from the side. What you can control though is what is the system that you operate in. So if you use like anonymous asset holding companies to make it where you don't own anything and that it's all held anonymously, if you do all of your business operations and through operating companies, make it where you operate like rich people do, where you don't own anything, but you have companies and those companies own those things and you control them, then that's how you set yourself up to win the game, really. In an area where you can't control the inputs, you got to control the outputs. I think a lot of people have this perception like, oh, I'll do that stuff when I have enough money or when it's worth it. What, like, what does it cost for someone who's starting out and going, okay, I want to put some protections in place. I mean, I know so many people that don't even do an LLC. Right. But you get like protections in place where they say, okay, I'm going to set up a holding company. I'm going to set up my first anonymous asset company. How much money is all that for initial setup going to cost for someone who's like just entering this idea? I mean, it it really uh, can depend, right? On a number of factors. I would say that everybody should set up an LLC, especially if you're making over $50,000 a year. Because if you're making over $50,000 a year, you should have that LLC tax as an S corporation and save yourself unemployment tax. And then the next question you have to ask yourself is like, is it the right time for me to set up asset holding companies? And the answer is, do you care if the stuff that you have right now gets taken from you? Because if you do, then you need an asset holding company. If you don't, then you don't need one, right? Because you're going to... Really, the question is you're saying, is life still going to be okay if this kind of scenario happens? And if you're saying, nah, life is going to actually be really brutal if that scenario happens, then I'd say, great, 
well, then let's do some preparation work. It's like the reasons why we buy insurance for like our automobiles and stuff like that is the same reasons why we should be looking about legal protection and other protections. Now, for our clients that are making good income, like typically making over 200K a year, when they come in and being able to see what it is that we're able to do like on the tax side of the fence for them, I mean, we're saving people over twenty to twenty five thousand dollars in taxes every year from using like private foundations, retirement, advanced retirement planning options, like really making sure they're maximizing the um, deductions, etc. And those get really expensive, right? Those are like twenty thousand plus in relationships for us, but it's because we're saving so much money on the taxes, right? So the taxes actually end up becoming like the best asset people have that gives them a fifty to one hundred percent annual return for what it costs to do good tax planning. If you're making over one hundred fifty two hundred k a year, it's typically where we see that. But if you're like making less money than that, then it's keep it simple, like an LLC to hold your assets, a separate LLC, tax as an S corporation to save money on self employment tax, and just keep it there. If you're making more money, then you need more tax planning and some more sophistication is really going to help you. So let's talk about that because that's very interesting to me because a lot of people, I've been involved in a lot of LLCs and people always do like my first business partner opened an LLC with a bank that was like nine hours away from either of us. I was like, why did you, because it was like, he's like, I'll save an extra 1% on taxes. And I was like, I don't know about that. It's like too much complexity. I want to be able to go to the bank, right? There was no branch in either of our cities. And he was like, and a lot of people like think they have to set up their LLC in Las Vegas. I know it has some tax benefits and stuff, but there's other complexities there. As in there's costs, you have to have a location or pay for the office and all of those things. But I've never heard about this idea of having two LLCs. And this is interesting. I want to get into this. So someone starting out, a lot of people think it's expensive to start an LLC, right? They think, oh, but you can do it yourself. It doesn't cost that much money. I think it's a couple hundred dollars at most. So you set up two, right? One LLC is the business and one LLC is your stuff. So your car, your house, that kind of stuff belongs to the second LLC. How do you firewall the two? Yeah, it has to do with like, how do you operate, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to hold all the assets. Either you want to create these LLCs in Delaware, Texas, Nevada, or Wyoming, a states that have strong charging order protection. All of those, I really like Texas because it doesn't have any annual fees, but Wyoming is by far the most popular. Nevada and Delaware are, are can be expensive for other reasons. And so you would then set up two LLCs. I like for my asset holding company, I like to use a series LLC if I'm located in any state besides California. The series LLC allows me to create one company to, to form, one company to maintain, one EIN number, one set of accounting books. But a series LLC allows me to create an infinite number of LLCs essentially for free, right? So that becomes really baller if you're making like investments inside of syndications, you're owning real estate or other hard assets because you can compartmentalize every single asset for free. So if there's a lawsuit against one asset, like grandma slips and falls on one of your rental properties, she can't come after any of your other properties. She can't come after you. She can't come after your businesses. It's all compartmentalized. And then for your operating company, it's a completely separate, just traditional LLC. And if you have a brick and mortar store, then you have to form in the state where you're located, right? If you don't have a brick and mortar, then sometimes there can be options of forming in a state where it's really cheap and easy for compliance purposes. And then to just use that LLC as the front facing name for the front facing company that you're doing business through. So it's two company structure is absolutely essential. And then you have to just manage the, the books and the banking of those as if they're separate entities. And make sure that your asset holding company is not directly doing business with anyone because you don't want that company directly doing business with anybody because then now all of a sudden that company has liability. So you want to keep that the thing that holds all of the assets having the least amount of potential lawsuits that can come against it as you possibly can. And then you operate, right? And then there's more complexity onto this too, right? Where it comes into like, well, how do you want to layer in your tax saving vehicles? How do you integrate all of your estate planning that comes with that? And how do your insurances have to work? And that's where like firms come in handy. Because if you just need like a basic like LLC, like those are people have really figured out how to do that, like really cheaply, right? And if you're at that level, you're like, God, I got to save every cent that comes into it, then you should just do that and do the absolute basics. If you're starting to make some, say, make serious money, making over 150K, you're starting to have like over half a million dollars in assets. This is where it starts to make sense to uh, start hiring professionals to look over your shoulder because now you have some stuff that's worth, like if you lose, you're going to be sad or you're going to lose money on taxes because you're not tax optimal. Yeah, I think. What you're talking about for the beginners is so important because a lot of people think, oh, I don't do anything until I'm making the 200K, right? And then they, then sometimes something happens before they hit there. And what you mentioned about one asset per LLC inside the series is so important. I was studying this thing about Masterworks. Everyone's like, oh, I can mess in art now. And what Masterworks does is every single art piece, every painting has its own LLC. So they're all firewalled and it's exactly the same thing. So each painting is its own company. So if there's a problem with one, the other ones don't get affected. And that's really 
important because sometimes people you hide all of your you put all of your assets in one company, but something happens in one asset, like yeah, your car is owned by the same company as your house, you can still end up being the same problem, right? If it's in the same LLC, your car accident can still affect the house. That's right. That's why you need to compartmentalize everything. And then we like to hide everything behind anonymous trust as well, because we know it's like really good to have the, the compartmentalization saves you. If you're sued, you can only lose that one thing. But the anonymous trust layered on top to it makes it where like, let's say that one of those sharky litigation attorneys, you know, you get into that car accident, it's a bad car accident, and people get really hurt. And, you know, four people in a car, like you're talking millions of dollars in medical bills and all pain and suffering and all that stuff. And your car insurance policy might only cover five fifty to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, depending upon what policy. So what you want to do is you want to take all of your assets then is then hide them behind revocable grantor trusts, which are just anonymous trusts. They just screen the name of the entity and your name off of the public record. And then you can use an attorney to be able to be the person connected to that trust with like their name and their address. So that way, all of the information is further protected by the attorney client privilege. So your name doesn't hit anything on the public records. It's hidden behind these anonymous trusts and then it's compartmentalized. And you'd be surprised how affordable this stuff is. It doesn't complicate your life at all. It all runs in the background and um, provides insane levels of protection because it makes it look like you qualify for food stamps. If anybody ever looks to come after you and people that look like they don't have anything, just don't get sued. And then you're also able to integrate in these additional protections. And I always tell people, I was like, you're better off doing things like the right way, but just at a very small level, right? But do things the right way. Just do it in a small level because then you're learning systems and processes instead of just saying like, well, at some point in the future that I don't even know when I'm going to take some action. That, that stuff never happens. You just keep kicking it down the road for forever. Yeah, that's why I like talking about the beginner phase stuff because I've met people who their home address is still their business address. That happened with someone I was working with last year. I was like, are you crazy? You know, this app, early days when people would set up websites, it would list your home address for anyone who looked up your website's DNS before they made it free to anonymize that, which is crazy because I knew people who had a customer or someone visited their blog then came to their house. You have to have a business address that's not your home address for sure. And it's like really basic things and like, oh, I can use my social security number as my LLC number, right? Like people learn that trick. And it's like, no, you want a separate EIN. It's not expensive. If you go, I went through it. Like I talked to an accountant once and he was like, it was very expensive per LLC number. And I was like, well, I can just do it myself for $50 because I've got, I did it for my first two. So I think that's important for people to see in that you really do have to do stuff from the beginning, like separate your personal and business bank account. And that's what I want to dive into next because this is interesting to me very, because I'm going to have to do a whole bunch of stuff after this call because I got to get more sophisticated is what about your bank accounts? If all of your bank accounts are under your LLC, does the, the asset holding one, do you have bank accounts over there? And is that where you move your money to? Yeah. So what you want to do is you want to take in all of your money through your operating company because right? that's your front facing company. And then after the money gets taken from the operating company, it gets shifted over to your asset holding company. And that's where your like long-term cash storage is. And that's where you're going to be pulling stuff out of to make investments with or whatever. Right. And then at the end of the year, then that money that you have that you want to take in as like profits to you gets distributed from your asset holding company to you. Likely all these things are going to be all disregarded entities or it's going to be disregarded entities from the asset holding side, right? And then your S corporation will have like an employee, a W-2 wage that it pays to you and also dividend income. So you'll have two tax returns at this point. You'll have two bank accounts. You'll have accounting records that show here is the income and income and expenses for each asset. If there is separate in, uh, income and expenses for each asset inside of your asset holding company, say if you have like a series LLC, that would be the case. And it's really, really simple to, to navigate. I think we have like 11 eBooks, 2000 hours of instructional videos over at the royallegalsolutions.com website that walks everybody through. Here's exactly how it works. Our goal was to always give away all the info for free. And then people that want to hire us, get great. If not, then they're, if they're on the DIY self, like, like you are Jonathan on it, of like, Hey, I can just set this up. And it's like, well, we want to get, make sure you get sure you have the best information to actually do it right. Cause most people don't, right. But it's possible to do it if you are diligent, detail oriented, and uh, have some great training out there about what that looks like at, at a high level. So, but that's how that works. And I answer your question about the banking. Yeah, that's really good. Cause that's something that I think that people sometimes forget money is an asset. So they're just, they might put in their car or their house or a rental property, but you want your money behind that wall too, because that's the first thing they go after. I knew someone, he got sued and the lawyer didn't go to court that day. And the, they just pulled the money out of his account. He just went, he looked in the account and there was just the money was gone because that's what the government can do. And 
it's just like, you don't realize all it takes is one mistake. I guess if your lawyer forgets to show up, like that's obviously a pretty big mistake on their part. But I remember I was there that day working with him and he was like, 75 grand is gone. Just like that, because it was in that account. It like happens out of nowhere, right? It's just like, then all of a sudden now like the money's gone. Like that's what people don't understand about like the power of like lawsuits is that you can get sued for an unlimited amount of money and then they can just start taking your stuff right <laughs> into it. It's wild. There's this perception that if I'm honest, everyone else will be honest and no one will ever sue me and nothing bad will ever happen that kind of, and it's the same thing I see when people like get into, like get accused of a crime, they go, well, I'll just be honest and I don't need a lawyer and everything will work out. And it never does, right? It always ends up terribly for them. So it's interesting. There's these two systems, right? There's the system of how things really work. And then there's the belief that if I'm just a good enough person, no one will ever sue me. No one will ever be bad. No business partner will ever do anything shady to me, but the protections are really critical. And I think it's something that we think that it's only for rich people, right? We think, oh, I only need to do that when I'm thinking about pat inheritance stuff or passing assets to my kids, but it, things can happen before then. There's so many surprises in life. What are some of the most common mistakes people make in addition to the ones you've already talked about that people make when they're starting their businesses or their early days of their business? I think especially there's this thing now where everyone calls their business a side hustle, which I hate because it means they don't take it seriously. And which means that those of you who definitely aren't doing LLCs are like putting the structures in place because they're still just dabbling. What are some really big mistakes people are making in that phase? Like maybe in the first two to three years of their business? It's a really good, quick, great question, right? And especially around the point of like, when do you supposed to set this stuff up? Our average client is typically between the ages of 35 and 60. They're males. They typically make over $150,000 a year and they haven't done a whole lot in the past. Or they, if they have, they've done it on their own and they're looking to step it up to the next level of like, okay, how do I make sure all of my estate planning is really right with all my LLC structuring? And how do I make sure I'm paying the minimum in tax? And most of them, don't know that like as W2 wage earners, even that you can still do stuff to protect yourself with taxes using private foundations and cool stuff that's out there. Like they're like, oh, no, I don't have my own business. So I can't. It's like, no, absolutely. You can. And if you have a really sophisticated tax advisor like we are, then these are the types of things you should be paying less than 10% in total tax on your effective tax rate. If you don't know what your effective tax rate is, you figure that out. Because if you're paying over 10%, you're overpaying from what we see is like typical into it. And the real the reality of the situation is, is that a lot of times it's like that people people really screw up is that they try to cut so many corners, right? Business is really done. Business is... People are... I feel like... John, tell me if you have feel differently about this. But I feel like businesses and how the business runs and how wealth gets created is supposed to be boring, right? It's supposed to be like a very formulaic, like step-by-step. Step. I come in here, I turn these cranks, and then this is like the outcome. And that's what they call like best practices, and when you operate by best practices, that's how it works. The part of what your product is and how you're innovating to be able to help somebody, that's the creative side. But that's the product. It's different than your business. It's different than wealth, right? Like you're not supposed to go out there and invest in super shiny objects that are going to blow up by 10,000%. Your wealth is supposed to create it like in a formulaic, predictable way. And I think that's where I see people get messed up as they think that like they can cut the corners of the ways that people have always done it. That's the most effective way to repeatable result into it. And then what happens is like something blows up, right? It's going well for a while. They're like, cool, I didn't need an LLC. I'm just going to run and gut it and like my own name because I didn't want to spend the money and have to figure out how LLCs work and bank accounts or whatever. And it goes really well for two and a half years. And then one thing happens and boom, their business is gone because they didn't set up an LLC, right? That's dramatic, right? But it's the same thing, right? Of like, if you say, well, if you just follow the basic practices of what's the best principle here, that thing would have never happened to you. But you would have had to go like a minutia level slower in the short term to just do things the right way. Yeah. I see that a lot of people get caught by the flash, right? Like we see all of these investment platforms that like guarantee a 10% or 20% return. And like they say, there's no risk, right? And all of these, like, that's how everyone got excited by crypto. And what happens? It turns out that... There was something shady going on that's only create returns that are unnatural, right? You can't create a 30% return without any risk. There's not low risk and high return. It's one or the other. And I see that same idea, right? Is that people go high risk because they get it's really exciting. One of the biggest lessons I ever learned was from someone in real estate who said, every deal you look at the downside, not the upside. Because it's easy to get emotional about a deal that can change your life. But it, what, that's why most people, a lot of people in real estate, right? One bad deal takes them out because they didn't look at the risk. They don't look at the risk profile. And that's a huge part of my business when I get approached with a project is I look at how much risk I have in my business right now, right? If a project pays me up front, that's a no risk. If it pays me based on results, that's a high risk. And I look at that because especially if there's a component outside my control, like if they have to sell the product or release it, that's high risk. And a lot of people don't think about risk profiles. And it's the same way that 
all of these like Instagram ads and promises of you can make massive wealth by putting all your money here and there. And it's, you're right that the most boring stuff is the most effective. The most boring part of my business is my systems. And the, every time I work on systems, my revenue goes up a lot. And more than anything else, working on project management software, working on spreadsheets, every time I improve that part of my business, everything else gets better. And it's not the fun part. It's the least fun part, right? Everyone hates spreadsheets. I certainly do. So I think this is, and this reason I had you on is because it's important. Sometimes we want to talk about the fun stuff, but then it's not the most important stuff. And I really like talking about this because I always learn things that can help me continue to improve and continue to improve the way I approach the business and the way I do the numbers and the way I create protections as I have four kids and we have a very specific things we're trying to create for them. And there's, I think my, one of my great regrets is that we got rid of financial education in America. Like they used to have home ec, which everyone thinks was cooking. It was like, no, home economics. When I graduated high school, I didn't know the difference between AP why an APR, right? Like a credit card and a bank account, like one gives you money and one takes you money, right? Interest rates. And we don't understand that stuff. And there's really, really poor financial literacy in America, which is surprising, but most people don't know the difference between an S corp and a C corp and an LLC and a sole proprietor. And they think sole proprietor is a great idea, but that's the most vulnerable. So this is like really critical education. That's just so lacking. Like a lot of people don't understand banks at all, right? Like where do the fees come from and can I move to a lower cost fee and what are the trade-offs? And that's so important. So when someone is transitioning from working for someone else to working for themselves, there's a lot of changes, right? Like you're used to working with other people and now you're by yourself. Like the way I work is high risk because it's all on me, right? If you work for a large company, you don't do a good job. You get paid either way if you work your hours, whereas if you work yourself, if you don't perform, then the money's not there. What can someone who's in that transition phase, what are the kind of ways they can manage their risk profile and limit risky behavior? Because there's a lot of information and it's not always good information. I mean, yeah, I think it's really just about following a best practice, right? If you just follow a best practice, typically what you're going to find is that's the right balance between the amount of risk to take and that's inside of a, a solution, right? The, the, I think where it comes to before, right, is we're saying it's like, well, where does it... Where the way that we tried to solve this problem is by offering free education for everything that we right. We know is that the more people that become wealthy, right, or the more people that get on the path to actually just doing some of the right things, will eventually uh, turn into customers for us in the long term. So that's why we committed to. That's why we commit to having thousands of hours of like video instructionals out and books to be able to talk about this stuff, because the reality is that it's always worse to not follow a best practice game plan, right? And if you're making the transition to say, there's really clear benchmarks, right? If I'm making the transition to, if I'm still in W2, then I need to set up a private foundation. And I need to start making oil and gas machinery and construction machinery type investments that will apply against my W2 income to be able to lower my tax rates. Great. Now that I have enough money to do in this, then great. Now I'm going to go stake off on my own because I have enough of a runway and I have enough of investment that I can make to start my side hustle or to start my own business. You start making that business, you say, great, I'm going to put it inside of an LLC because inside of that LLC is where I know that if any of my clients, something goes wrong with one of my clients and they sue me, they can't come after all of my personal assets. I'm going to limit my liability in doing that. Once I start making over 50 thousand dollars a year, then I'm going to say, great, I'm going to take that LLC and I'm going to have elected to have it taxed as an S corporation. I'm going to split the dividend, the income between dividend income and W2 income from my own company that I have there. I'm going to save on self-employment tax and I'm going to keep going for that. As I start making more money, then this is where I'm going to still keep pushing money into the private foundation that I'd already set up that protects 30% of my AGI. And I'm also going to start looking at asset holding companies because now I'm starting to have maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars like stacked away, and then I want to have pushed into investments in the market or inside of alternative investments like storage units, real estate pieces, a host of other things that we help clients connect with. But you can really invest in whatever you want to, right? But you should be doing an asset holding company once you start having, especially six figures being pushed into uh, inside of assets, and then you continue to grow. And after that. What really all turns into is an investment and tax game is understanding what are the finances in my life? How do those flow through to help me save the most money I can on taxes for me to control my expenses and to push as much money I can into investments that generate me passive income? Because with asset based passive income, that's actually how I become financially free. My business is not safe enough for me to become financially free because businesses go up and down in cycles, products change, AI comes to the market, could blow up the whole thing. So if you really want to say like, cool, I'm financially free. Only people that are actually financially free are the ones that have asset-based financial freedom numbers. Because like your apartment checks that come in from owning your apartment, those come in every month because people got to live, right? You need stuff that's like that. That's the boring side of life. 
but it's also the exciting side of life. Because if you follow the, this, the game plan that I teach about, how do you get from the very beginning, the game plan I just gave you, the 10,000 foot up overview, your wealth and your financial freedom is guaranteed. It's the speed of it. It's just going to be what's the speed of your execution. How sophisticated can you get on your financial education? Because everybody has pretty terrible financial education coming in. And then also it's how well do you actually understand the way that your business works to increase your top line revenue? Then you need to understand how your taxes work to make sure the government doesn't take it from you from taxes and that you don't lose it from a lawsuit. And then you need a deal network that says, well, actually, where do I push this income into? And is it possible for me to get 10, 15 plus percent cash flowing types of investments to me and how do those work and how does that play out for me long term? So like getting wealthy and getting financially free isn't easy, but it's understood, right? All of this stuff is very well understood on how to do it. It's just about putting in the time um, to do it. If you don't do it, you may never get there. If you do it, I can guarantee it's easier than you think. There's a lot of like all these things online that are like form business here, form business there, and they charge these huge fees and they set you up like with a remote office and a lot of people get pulled in by these things and they spend three or $5,000 just setting up an LLC, not because they don't know you do yourself. Like when I filed my first trademark, when I filed my first trademark, I got all these letters from lawyers saying, Hey, you totally messed up. You've got to help us pay us a huge fee. We'll fix it. And I was like, no, I think I did it right. And my trademark got approved, but there was so much, I guess, as soon as you submit your information, like they auto email you and send letters and stuff saying, and I've already gotten letters now because I just have up, I'm up for my renewal because it's been five years. But it's like there's this we're convinced that things are so hard that we need to pay really expensive services for the basic stuff. And then what happens is when someone needs a service like yours later on and they're like, well, I got burned the first time. I'm afraid to use a better service. So what are some things that people can do when they're looking at their options and they're looking for like how to form an LLC in different companies? What are like red flags that like it's a shady company or that they're massively overcharging? Because I've run into this in multiple things. The same thing happened when I was marrying my wife, all the paperwork for the visa because they live in another country. All these lawyers was like, oh, for a couple thousand dollars, we'll help you. And I was like, I did it myself and it cost $200 and we got everything worked on the first try. So it's not always as hard as we think it is, right? At some level. So what are the red flags to look for when someone's like looking for setting up an LLC or a remote office or um, a remote mailbox or these different services? Like, what are the things that like you definitely tell people watch away, watch out for those because you're just overpaying or getting get it burned? Yeah, I feel like this is like one of those <laughs> conversations that comes in where it's like it was my first guy that was trying to hire me to be his, for a sales coach, and I was like, why do I need to be a sales coach? I'm locking down sales. I know how to convert. I can run you through like a slide deck and a script. And like, I can convert you all day. Right. And he's like, yeah. But he says, what happens? Like if all of a sudden you stop converting, do you have anybody that's helping you coach through what happens in a change scenario? Or is your conversion rate as good as it could be led into it? Or is it just working? And how do you know it's really working the way it should be? Right. Maybe it's way better into it. And how is that going to fit into the other parts? So there's like all these questions that came up to it. Right. It's there's a difference between thinking that something works and then something works well. That comes into it. But so the question I think really boils down into is how do you actually know what's quality and what's not, right? Yes. So anybody whose quality is going to charge you money to it, but they should be able to show you some stuff that you don't understand, right? Like the people that I've met in my life that I like spend money on, and I spend a ton of money on coaches and professionals that I work with, right? And I have a deep ass network of ballers that I know just from me being my entrepreneurial experience, being an investor, being an attorney. And what I'm always looking for is people to be able to tell me concepts I don't really understand yet. Right. Like you need to be able to tell me something that's possible that I don't necessarily believe is possible. Then you need to be able to explain to me how is that possible coming into it. And then and then I want to dig into what's the education behind it. So that's what we've endeavored to do. I mean, World Legal Solutions is a team of 30 people, four attorneys, big team of paralegals who operate nationwide. And the big piece of it is that I said all of our education is going to be free. And we offer a weekly group coaching for all of our clients coming in, which is about 40 people every single week that come into it. And that we give away as people come in as their first point of contact to us. We'll say, well, what are you, what are you working with right now? And whatever the thing is they're working on, whatever problem they come in with, like we immediately start to pair them with like, here's our best education materials that are about that subject. Because we know that like education is really like where it's at. That's our first, we got to get educated before people can take action because we're the, the lowest price of the top end providers, right? So we're never going to compete with like legal zoom on LLCs, right? So what do we have to be able to deliver to people is going to be something that says we actually, uh, we understand better how all the things have to work inside of a system. Because it's not just an LLC. It's like the LLC that really, and how does it relate to your state planning? How does the LLC relate to your asset holding company? How does the LLC relate to your taxes? All of those pieces that have to come into it, that's what you're supposed to pay professionals for. It's not forming the LLC. The LLC is easy, right? Of 
course. But it's how does the whole business have to operate is where you want to be looking for who do you hire professionals, whether you work with us or somebody else, right? So that's the piece. Is that when you're trying to look at like who, how do you qualify? My, prof- my personal opinion, when you're looking to qualify professionals, that's what I want to see. It's all your education up front. Is it free? Do you hide things behind paywalls? If you do, then you're always playing a game with me that says that you're going to be trying to monetize information like in an inappropriate way. You should be monetizing action, not information. And then two, who can I meet of your of like you've helped so far? Can I talk to them about what the actual process is like? And three, are you telling me some concepts I don't really understand? And I think that like most people that hearing the concepts that I broke down about like, here's how it shifts from private foundations and how you tree scale up between like your first LLC to your asset holding company to your state planning and all those pieces work together. That's what I'm trying to do right now is be like, hey, are these concepts and ideas that are already super fluent for you? Because if they are, you're an absolute animal. And I actually want to talk to you about how in the hell you learned that because it took me eight years to figure all this out. And if those are new things for you, then I'm like, great, well, come get more educated. Right. And then if you get more educated, then I'll potentially be willing to work with you as a client, but I'm not going to work with anybody that's not educated because it's too difficult to work with them because they don't understand like what, how things are supposed to be working there. And I think this is where I'm trying to hit. And Jonathan, you can tell me, man. I mean, I'd love to have some feedback, but that's exactly the line I'm trying to ride, which is like, how in the world do we possibly vet high level professionals in our lives? Because if you can't know exactly what it is they do, what are all the context clues about like, who's quality? Yeah. I always look for that because. In every industry, right? There's always like a bunch of coaches pop up, like everything. You're like, oh, there's, I'm a script writing coach. How many movies have you made? (laughs) None. I just coach. Well, wait a minute. Like, I always look at that stuff. And for me, I write a lot of books. And sometimes, editor, I had an editor come to me. She's like, I'll re edit your book for $17,000. I was like, my book's number two. It's like outselling Harry Potter right now. What are you going to do for it? And she's like, well, I'll fix all the mistakes. And I was like, yeah, but it's got 500 five star reviews. What are you going to do? And I was like, She's like, well, I'll make it perfect grammar. And I said, let me ask you this. How many of your clients are bestselling authors? She got real mad. And I said, oh, that's because I said, that's what I care about. Like for me, I, if my book has a ton of mistakes, but it's the best selling book in the world and I've got 5 million new customers, like I'm okay with that. Like that's, and so I always look for people who their decision making calculus matches mine because some people like what they want is not what I want. Like I don't care. I had a boy once who was like really obsessed with reach. And I said, yeah, I don't care about that metric. That's imaginary. I care about dollars. Like reach is how many friends you could have had. Like for me, reach is uh, in high school, I could have had 500 friends because 500 other guys went to my high school. That was my reach. I didn't have 500 friends. So that's why I hate that metric. So I always look for people that can talk about concrete metrics and people, again, I do hate when people hide the basic stuff behind a paywall. There's always things like I can explain exactly what I do. If anyone asks me, give me two hours, I can explain my entire process for planning and road mapping, writing a book, making a bestseller. It doesn't mean you can do it, right? But I'll explain it to you. And that's the thing. Sometimes people hide the information. I used to be that way too. Oh, I'm a writer. So if you want my words, you got to pay for them. And we think that if I hide the words so people pay for it, I'll seem more valuable. But actually what people think is, wow, if this is the free stuff, the paid stuff must be amazing. And so actually the more you give away, the more that people trust you and are, will invest larger money with you. And that's how you go from exactly selling the $97 LLC package to the $50,000 setting up seven trust package. And it's like, which market do you want to be in? Like charging for information or charging, like you said, for action. So those are the things I look for. Like I get approached, as you can imagine, constantly with offers to promote to my audience and also constantly with different types of coaching things. And I'm like, do you know something I don't know? Or I always look for like, oh, is what you're doing now working? What if it stops working? Well, then maybe I'll talk to you. Right. Like that's a weird pitch. I wouldn't respond to that, but there is, and it's the thing is there's remorse in every market, right? Like what happened in 2008, the market went down. Everyone became a realtor in 2020. We had all the lockdowns. Everyone suddenly was a coach. And I met, never forget someone one time I said to someone one time who was like suddenly a coach. I said, well, why are you a coach? I said, he goes, I'm not a coach by choice. The people demanded it. I was like, yeah, but I know you don't have any clients. So that's definitely not true. So (laughs) it's like, I, that one was like, oh, wait a minute, because the people aren't demanding and clamoring for it, right? Like the people are demanding it is different. And it's, that's the thing is that it's so murky because entrepreneurs, because there's no financial literacy, it's very easy to prey on people, right? Because we don't know how do you, what should an LLC cost? I remember when I'm, someone was like, oh, it, it cost me like a thousand dollars to set up an LLC for you. I was like, wait, what? Like it doesn't, it just doesn't cost that, right? Because it's a, I know what it costs, but if you don't know what it costs, then you don't know when someone is overcharging you. And that's like where things get tricky. And so that's why getting, that's why like when I pick guests for this show, I look for people that 
can teach me things I don't know and can teach my audience things they don't know. And there's, especially in areas where the information is very, like there's just so much information out there about what you should do. If you Google form an LLC, it's a nightmare. <laughs> like it's a nightmare of information that's like, all these different things like, oh, I need to have my LLCs in different states from each other and I need to have different mailing things. And I know people who like, you you can't send them letters <laughs> because their way their, their thing is set up, like their address isn't real or they have a P, like common mistake I know about is you set up a PO box because, oh, I have a PO box. Well, guess what? So many forms say no PO box allowed, right? And so you can't use that. And that's like, it's weird because you can't use a PO box for stuff with the government for half your stuff, right? And yet when you send in your taxes, you send that to a PO box. So these little things that we think we're doing the right way. Like I made a mistake. I wish when I'd set up my mailing stuff, I did one of the services that will scan and send me the letter when I want to see it. Instead, I have to have them send it to my mom's house and she tells me what and scans it. So that was a mistake I made <laughs> 12 years ago, right? Like, whoops. But that address is on my driver's license and everything. I, to go back to America and change, it would take two months because everything is pointing to that address on my bank accounts and everything. But we're always going to make mistakes. But the important thing, and this is why I'm really glad I had in the show, is to see that you can always make it better and that you can't predict when bad things are going to happen. Nobody was predicting lockdowns. Nobody was predicting the 2008 economic downturn. Most of the time when bad stuff happens, it's not your fault. Like you said, a lot of people, they do everything right. And still someone says, oh, here's an opportunity here because they haven't done their finances right. Might as well sue them. Might as well pull a little slip and fall. And I think that's like the main question that comes to my the always is for me is about like what makes life more durable, right? If I can't control actually what's going to happen in life, what are all the things that I can control that help me set up to be able to say I can take as many risks off the table, right? So it's like, cool, I got LLCs that they're, those are going to protect me from lawsuits, right? And then I have my business. And then it's like, great, well, I'm going to grow my business from having a high ticket offer in here that I'm going to promote because that's going to let me bring in more cash and I can accelerate the growth of my business with that cash. But I'm also going to have some really banging ass subscription services that I know are going to be cheap and but they're going to be super high value. And now that turns into like my steady revenue generation. So I de-risk my business. And then my profits, I take those and I invest them inside of stuff that's going to double my money each like five-ish years, right? Like with through some real estate stuff, through storage units and apartments and those kind of things, because that's how I de-risk my assets into it. And I have like cash flow that comes in through that. And then I'm looking at like, well, great, what are the other just simple wins that I can make? And it's almost always in tax, right? It's in tax and using private foundations. And using the right kinds of investments, whether between real estate or like oil and gas machinery types of investments that pay me good returns and then help me get like lower inside of my tax. So everywhere along the way in my life, it's always about creating stability, like as much possible stability as I can, because life for me actually is okay as long as it always keeps getting better. Right. And so a life that is always better the next day than it was the day before because of the way that I'm growing. It says, regardless of what happens the rest of the world, if there's like a lawsuit or an economic downturn or I get sick or whatever, and life actually still continues to be okay. To me, that's what it's all about. Right. And if I can just take all these risks off the table that make life spike down, right, then I'll avoid that stuff that makes people age 10 years in a year. Right. So that's the way I think about it. And too, I don't know if you think about it differently. No, I, like I mentioned earlier, I think that risk management is such an important part of business because we get caught up in the growth. And so we take any job, any prospect, like early on, you're like, I'll take any client, no matter what. And you take on the client that takes up all your time. And then you can't take the higher paying client. Like the best client I ever had early days was like, look, my time is worth so much more than yours. Calling you on the phone is losing me money. I'll just send you the money every single month. You send in one email a month. Someone on my team will read it and I'm never going to talk to you again. I spoke to him the day I, he hired me and the day I closed that business down, I was moving in another direction. And it was like, that's the client you want, not the one who's calling you every single day because it's their last $500 a month. And that's part of risk management is that going, oh, this isn't the right thing to do. And we think about risk there, but it's also important to think about how my, I worked so hard to make this money. How can I protect it? I was telling my wife earlier today, I was like, baby, it's so much easier to not spend a dollar and save a dollar than it is for me to make it. And it's like, we some, like the way people get really rich is controlling the money out more than controlling the money in. Cause it, the money in is exciting, but the money out is like, how can I control the cost on this? How can I get a discount? Like I'm always asking my kids school. I was like, Hey guys, if I pay a different way, can I get a little bit of a discount? Cause it adds up. And that's, really the difference. So I think de-risking is such a critical topic because we don't talk about it because it's scary, right? Like my friend one time was sick. He's like, I don't want to go to the doctor because I don't want to find out if I have something. And I think that's why people don't look at their taxes, don't look at their books. Certainly I'm guilty of that many times in the past and it always ends up becoming a problem. So this has been 
a really great episode. I appreciate you giving me so much of your time. What's the best place for people to find you? And where can they start finding all this free information to start figuring out how to set up their first LLCs, how to set up their first series LLC and get started on this journey? Yeah, best thing to do is actually just go to our homepage, royallegalsolutions.com. On there, it has all of the the prompts. So there's a badass like video that I have in there that's super educational. It's about 30 minutes long. There's a ton of client testimonials to see on there to see like, hey, do you fit if you're a real estate investor or other type of investor? And then you'll see that there's other like links on the at the top of the page to get into like our Mighty Networks. What we call is our is that's we host all of our content on Mighty Networks, and so that's the place where our community is interacting with each other. That's the way you can sign up for all of, like the free week of coaching that we do about creating wealth, protecting it, uh, as all the estate planning, the investing, all of those pieces that come in. So we're a huge community actually of entrepreneurs that happen to also be investors. And we're everybody shooting to be able to get to that 5 or 25 million net worth mark and get to their cash flow right to be able to have durable financial freedom. And so we, our belief is you need to be 5 million net worth to be able to say that, cool, I can have asset base, 5 million, invest appropriately, and then you should be like out of the game. So if you're interested about how to accelerate your path to that 5 million or if you're stretching it up to get to that next level of lifestyle at 25 million, then head up to royallegalsolutions.com and just start clicking on things and tell and get involved. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you again, Scott Royal Smith from Royal Legal Solutions. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Making that first dollar online doesn't have to be daunting. I've got you covered. Get my free guide on how to make your first thousand dollars online right now at servemaster.com forward slash one K. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Serve No Master podcast. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss another episode. We'll be back next week with more tips and tactics on how to escape the rat race. Please take a moment to leave a review at servenomaster.com forward slash iTunes. It helps the show grow and more listeners means more content for you. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.